Okay, well, uh, 12.01, why don't we get started so we can use the full hour. Um, if you are not uh, talking, uh, please consider muting if you've got background noise so everyone can hear everything. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the third and final day of the 2022 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. My name is Maddie Carlson. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Street Trust. Um, welcome to Fun Paths to Resilience, the Bike Revolution, Cargo Bike Disaster Relief, and Parking Reform. This is a three-part session with presentations about the fifth type of cyclist and a cultural shift, the disaster relief trials, and 20 reasons to repeal parking mandates. You can type any questions in the chat or use the raise hand tool, which are both found at the bottom of your screen. Please use the social media hashtag OATS22, O-A-T-S 22, to post about the summit on social media. And don't forget to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about our other programs and activities. I'm going to be back on at the end of the session to remind you about summit in-person events later today. Um, and now I'm going to introduce your first speaker as well as the moderator for this session, um, Dr. Z. Thank you, Maddie. Um, Dr. Zlata, Portland, Oregon, and uh, you are all having double vision. Um, and um, we've got two people in each screen uh, presenting uh, three different uh, panels. And we are really talking about the change of society. Uh, and I think to lead off, uh, Michael and Katie are going to talk about parking reform and, and just sort of a historical note that uh, in the early 90s, uh, 92, 93, um, both uh, Mayor Katz and also our dear friend Earl Blumenauer um, had confrontations with uh, an upstart organization called the BTA, which is the precursor to the Street Trust. And a, a lawsuit actually had to be brought against the city of Portland in order to have bike lanes and to have bike parking at the new Coliseum. So what was started multiple decades ago is still continuing. And we're gonna have a presentation by uh, Michael and Katie uh, just immediately. And then uh, Mike will follow talking about disaster uh, trial relief and the needs of our society. And then I'll talk about the emerging uh, uh, back to bikes uh, sort of fifth component of the uh, cycle response. So Michael and Katie, do you want to take it away and share your screen and take sure. it? We're on it. Cool. Katie, I've got great news. I just got a new job. Wow, congratulations, Michael. Thanks a lot. I'm going to be an urban planner in any town, Oregon. Okay, great. Yeah, so my first assignment is I get to rewrite the parking code. I've got a few questions for you because you're really smart. Uh, what, oh, uh, is, is there a, like a, a, a grocery store near your house? Yeah, there's like a little mini mart. Okay, cool. How many parking spaces do they have? Um, I think it has four. Okay, great. Uh, is there a restaurant near your house? Oh, sure, like a block away. Cool. What about it? Oh, uh, well, how many parking spaces do they have? It has 10, I think. Michael, are you just copying down everything I'm saying? Y yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get best practices from other communities for how many parking spaces people should need to have. Oh, Michael, you're really a planner now. This is the actual process that most cities use uh, to determine how much land they require for parking. Uh, the other, uh, if you, we're, we're gonna work on the slide advancement here. <laughs> Uh, have you seen the price of apartments near the Nike headquarters? It is great that people get to live near work, but the rents in these units are out of control. The thing most people don't know about those units and why they need to cost so much, though, is that a lot of it is spent building the actual parking. If you ask uh, people sort of what should the usual rules be for parking around a new apartment, I think a lot of people will say, oh, well, I mean, there should be one for every apartment if in case somebody needs it. And the uh, parking should be free. But if you think about it, what that really means is you need to pay for the parking whether you need it or not. And if you do the math, it turns out that that adds about $330 a month to everybody's rent for that price of that just in case. People don't wanna pay for parking and I don't either, um, but you do all the time every day with everything you buy. Free parking is included in the price of, of your coffee to your grapes. In the US, on average, each year, 
the annual subsidy for free parking is about $600 per person, whether you drive or not. And unlike Governor Newsom's subsidy for drivers, this one keeps automatically renewing every year. This is a chart of household income for tenant households in the United States by car ownership. So if you look at this, the households on the left side of the chart have lower incomes and fully half of them own zero cars. And if you look across the chart, you can see that more than half of all tenant households own either zero or one cars. The problem is if those people on the left side of the chart are being forced to pay for parking, whether they need it or not, where can they live if they don't want to pay for parking? The answer, of course, is they often live in crumbling old buildings that were built before parking mandates. This is a terrible system. We need to get new buildings in the pipeline that don't have as many parking spaces. Parking lots absorb heat during the day and releases it back at night when high temperatures become the most deadly. On the left, you can see a zoning map from Portland. This is of the Lentz neighborhood from the 1970s. The red and the blue areas include parking mandates, which are still relatively new. And on the right, you can see the urban heat islands in the evening today. And during a heat wave, sidewalks can fry eggs, but parking lots elevate the danger for the whole neighborhood. We don't have to go abroad to see examples of great walkable, bikeable urbanism. We can go downtown to Main Street in almost every single city in Oregon and around the country, around North America. The problem is that if the uh, rules say that when you open a new 2,000 square foot cafe, you also need to open 5,000 square foot of parking lots surrounding it, then Main Street is illegal. The parking mandates banned Main Street. This building in Fayetteville, Arkansas, sat vacant since 1972. It had a great location right on the edge of downtown, but it only had a handful of off-street parking spaces, not nearly enough to comply with the current zoning code. And even though it's possible for a developer to get a waiver or exemption for renovating a historic building, and a lot of people called, nobody really wanted to try. That was until Fayetteville repealed their commercial parking minimums, and now this is a thriving restaurant again. This is Susie for millennia. Susie and her mother's mothers have been trying to get to the pond where she was born to preserve their species and infuse our forests with life-giving nitrogen. But for the last 75 years, every time it rains, a torrent of too warm water carries all these little invisible brake particles and oil drippings down into the river. Susie can't lay eggs in that. Stop trying to kill Susie. A dramatic uptick in traffic, the online kind has caused even Walmart to ask towns for permission to build less parking than what their zoning code requires. You know what I love? It's going for a walk. You know what I hate? Going for a walk that's way too long. This is the city where I grew up, Toledo, Ohio. And over on the left side, there's a white dot that is my first favorite ice cream shop. I sometimes think about a thing that me and my family never ever did, which is walk down the street to look at the other businesses on this street. And of course, the reason we didn't was because there are these vast parking lots in between all of them. I looked recently to see if this ice cream shop was still open. It is not, it is vacant and the building is designated in Google as a historical landmark. How does transit connect to destinations that are surrounded by huge parking lots? Uh, the answer is not well. Either riders are forced on their own to navigate the sea of cars to get to their business or transit agencies and property owners have to negotiate to add a bus stop in front of the front doors, which adds time to the entire route. And during busy shopping seasons, like over the holidays, these parking lots can get so congested that the buses are forced to reroute again, which is not merry nor bright. Last year, southeast of Portland in Happy Valley, Catholic Charities tried to open the very first affordable apartment building in Happy Valley ever. They wanted to build 143 apartments, and the city code said, oh, for that, you need to build 240 parking spaces because in Happy Valley, even a studio apartment needs to come with 1.25 parking spaces, just in case. The uh, effect of that, of course, is that the affordable housing developer often says, oh, can we get a break on that? We don't need that much. And when they come to the city council to say, can we please have a break on that? Guess who shows up to say, oh, no, no, not around us. Parking mandates give leverage to bad actors. If somebody asked me to meet them in a parking lot, I assume that we're about to engage in a crime. <laughs> but people ask each other to meet up in parking lots all the time. They're just referring to former parking lots that are now awesome food cart pots. 
Food carts are the opposite of a parking lot. They smell great. There's lots of people and people travel from all over the country just to hang out in them. And it's only possible because someone decided it was okay to do something different with a few parking spaces. The biggest landlord in town is the town. Here in Portland, one fifth of all the land is dedicated to the streets. And about one third of all our streets is dedicated to the private storage of $6,000 devices. Why is that the case? Why are we giving all this space away for free for the most part? It's because we mandated that we create twice as many spaces off the street as well. That drove the price of the parking on the street to zero. And that's why Peabody is spending all this money maintaining a uh, space that it can't get any money from. What do subsidized bus passes, bike parking and on-site locker rooms all have in common? Even combined, they can't compete with free parking. A study of DC commuters found that charging anything for parking at work decreased the number of people driving alone to work than every transportation benefit combined. 30 years ago, Donald Shoup said that parking spaces are a fertility drug for cars. Last year, a group of grad students proved it. They found a randomized controlled sample that could determine that parking spaces actually change the way we are, change us. They make us more likely to drive. They make us more likely to own cars. I don't know if that's disturbing to you, but it freaks the hell out of me. Parking, the third rail of politics. No matter what the most recent public meeting you attended would have you believe, eliminating parking minimums is actually popular. A recent poll of Washington voters, not just any voters, but midterm voters, found that more than half of people agreed that we should eliminate parking minimums near transit. People who supported this the most were voters under 30, people of color, and renters. In other words, people who are most affected by housing shortages. No group in our poll, I'll say that again, no group had a majority in opposition against this reform. So, reform away. In 2019, AOC introduced her Place to Prosper Act. It is an anti-poverty bill that protects tenants from predatory landlords, it caps rent hikes, and it also slashes highway funding for any city that mandates parking with residential projects. AOC seems pretty sharp. I wanna stay on her good side. I think we should do what she says and end parking mandates. Oh, this is not what my closet looks like. I live in an old building from the 20s and my closet's about, uh, looks like this big. Is that even up to code, Katie? You know, most building codes don't even require closets at all. Really? Uh, why, why doesn't the developer just like save money by not building the, the closet at all? Michael, developers wanna make money and people like closets, even really big ones. <laughs> um, People think the same thing's gonna happen with parking. If you don't require it, no one's ever gonna build another parking space. But if there's a market demand for it, parking spaces are still gonna get built. The last slide in our presentation is the most exciting. We've been too freaked out to tell very many people about this, but in a few weeks, the Oregon Land Use Board, the Statewide Land Use Board is going to consider a proposal to reduce or eliminate parking mandates in every jurisdiction in the eight largest metro areas in Oregon. It would be one of the biggest reforms ever in the United States. And these are all the organizations, these are some of the organizations that have signed our letter in support of it and are gonna help testify. If you would like to be part of this, we would love to talk to you. Great, that's a wrap for us. Thank you so much. We'll wow. get back to Dr. Z. Oh, thank you. Um, we're going to zip right along to uh, Mike Cobb, my neighbor, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, disaster relief trials and just give us an awkward moment as we bring up um, the screen share. Uh, in 2000, my name is Mike Cobb, by the way, and uh, I helped to develop, design and develop disaster relief trials which is a um, disaster preparedness event in the form of a cargo bike competition, which displays the relevance of cargo bikes to citizen preparedness. And this was all inspired by uh, the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 uh, and the frustration um, generated from, from watching an inadequate relief response and understanding that um, because communication was so badly broken, uh, proximal villages could not exchange information about uh, 
uh, needs, uh, needs and, and uh, assets. And um, anyway, I uh, feeling frustrated from uh, watching the, the really slow protracted relief uh, in Haiti in 2010, I, th I, I tried to think of uh, something that I could add to the tableau uh, in disaster response to um, enable citizens, which FEMA says uh, are the primary responders in major disasters, not professional responders. Uh, in fact, FEMA says that 95% of disaster victims are rescued or aided by helpful ad hoc uh, neighbors. And uh, so the disaster relief trials was developed as a response to Haiti to demonstrate what uh, cargo bike enabled citizens could add to a uh, citizen response. Um, and, uh, and this is just uh, a reflection of um, really the uh, essential utility of bikes that's been shown and um, uh, highlighted and dehighlighted throughout history. Um, bikes have uh, offered lots and lots of utility and um, at least half of the patents in the patent office in the late 1800s. And you can bet there are a lot of load carrying bikes that would have been pressed into service uh, during natural disaster when other conveyances are disabled uh, by broken roads, uh, fuel shortages, and uh, other disruptions in infrastructure. I think you can use the arrows. Great. Um, so Stabby, 316,000 uh, ended up dying um, from primary uh, influences and then secondary and tertiary protracted uh, uh, relief uh, injuries. Um, infrastructure was destroyed, um, didn't allow for automobile travel for months and months. And a uh, disease outbreak was one of the, the secondary um, elements that um, was enabled by a very slow uh, relief response. Uh, and then in, in 2011 in Japan, obviously we had uh, more inspiration um, for showing off cargo bike relevance to citizen-based disaster response. And um, this in fact uh, inspired uh, some cohorts at Tsukuba University in Tsukuba, Japan to develop their own disaster relief trials using our model. Um, and in fact, this year, June 11th, uh, the Portland Disaster Relief Trials will host uh, students and a professor from Tsukuba University. Uh, they're going to compete and help. Uh, so, as I glossed over, um, the Disaster Relief Trials is an event that, that uh, has two missions. Uh, we want to show the relevance of cargo bikes to disaster relief um, with a lot of flair and a lot of fun um, and, and with uh, authenticity. Um, and, and then as races, as competitions do, uh, we want to stimulate the development of technique and equipment for the most effective versions of cargo bike based relief. And uh, so, and to, to even distill the mission, the double mission more, this is a, a cargo bike supply run um, uh, in a simulated environment of in infrastructure disruption. And uh, so we developed a model um, that includes 12 essential elements, uh, which allow uh, any would-be organizer to develop their own disaster relief trials and uh, adequately display the capabilities of a cargo bike. Um, uh, and I'm just gonna run through those. Um, time check, okay? You're fine. Okay, good. Um, uh, the disaster relief trials is comprised of a um, checkpoint series uh, that 
um, which which have addresses that are given to riders one hour prior to the start of the event, and um, and and that and everything is contained by the checkpoints. And uh, disaster relief trials events must have between five and ten checkpoints. And so this is where the supply runners pick up relief supplies, authentic relief supplies, and encounter encounter. Uh, uh, infrastructure disruption obstacles like broken terrain and uh, barriers and uh, a water feature. Um, and so, uh, as I said, at the checkpoints, um, cargo is picked up and uh, the full circ, if you uh, are in a category that uh, is tasked with the full circuit, you will accumulate 50 kilograms of cargo, which is about 110 pounds of cargo. And uh, a full circuit will take riders uh, at least, the fastest riders at least three hours representing a realistic shift. Essential element number four, um, the barrier that I mentioned, um, there must be a one meter barrier that riders encounter after uh, accumulating at least half of their relief supply payload. There's a water feature, uh, which is, um, awfully fun and um, <laughs> slightly dangerous uh, and uh, needs to be um, only uh, 50 meters in length and six inches deep. And that just demonstrates not that cargo bikes are good, uh, well, that cargo bikes are good uh, flood disaster responding tools um, within, within a, a scope. Uh, six inches being perhaps edge of the scope in a flood situation. Um, uh, rough terrain feature, uh, 400 meters in length, and it must make uh, um, most riders dismount, demonstrating that a cargo bike is a good hand cart. Competition monitoring um, allows us to demonstrate uh, radio communication um, uh, meshing radio communication with a uh, cargo bike supply runner mission uh, allows for monitoring of the riders, and this this allows uh, local emergency amateur radio operators to practice their craft. Um, uh, and the requirements are that at least uh, two checkpoints be um, monitored by radio operators who will uh, transmit um, participant information to the base, which is the start finish, where another amateur radio operator will uh, provide dispatch, um, a dispatch service and uh, a leaderboard will be populated with this real time radio transmitted data or information. Uh, so that's competition monitoring and allows for spectators uh, at the base, which is the start finish area, to see what's happening in real time, um, adds, adds some spectator uh, juice to the situation. <clears throat> so it's a self-navigated circuit of, of checkpoints and, um, and riders are given a laminated map, which also has a manifest on it, the manifest listing the checkpoints and what's to be achieved at each checkpoint. Uh, the map has the checkpoints um, uh, pinned and uh, allows for a non-electronic navigation device uh, navigation. Um, safety is super paramount um, in that it's, it's an open, open course situation technically. And um, so traffic laws uh, are obeyed at all times and disqualification results. Uh, if anybody's, uh, if anybody violates any traffic law, um, and we have insurance uh, for the venue for the this year for Cully Park venue that allows us to insure um, against liability. And uh, there's a, we always uh, recommend a bicycle safety check. We'll be employing that this year, uh, and um, naturally there's a waiver. Um, the start is a, always a, a Le Mans start, meaning that the rider is separated from the, their vehicle. 
and uh, they're required to do some sort of mission preparation, which declumps uh, a 50 rider um, group, um, allows, allows uh, the entry of riders into the uh, open streets to be uh, strung out naturally. And uh, there, there is a um, motor assist division allowed. And um, um, this year with the Oregon Bicycle Racing Association Insurance, we're limiting the, uh, the motor assist to um, thousand watt motors, which do not contribute after 20 miles an hour and which do not have a throttle function. And electronic navigation is allowed for the uh, e-bike category if they can prove that off-grid charging, uh, they have an off-grid charging system. And backing up to essential element number 11, the uh, e-assist category um, uh, allows for a, a two minute time bonus um, if you um, provide evidence of a um, off-grid battery, battery charging system. So that's the disaster relief trials. It's transferable from city to city. Um, and uh, this year, June, June 11th, we'll be hosting in Portland at uh, Cully Park. And um, uh, I'm going to um, wrap this up so I can hand off to to Jerry Z. Uh, the transferability has been demonstrated uh, over the years, starting in um, 2013, it spread from Portland to Eugene, Victoria, Seattle, and Boulder. And uh, 2014, 15, and 16 saw quite a few cities um, deploying disaster relief trials. Arling Arlington in 2018 and 2019, uh, uh, Virginia, and um, Tsukuba, Japan uh, in 2021. And uh, we're looking to um, spread like a virus, spread the model like a virus, if you will, um, too soon, I'm sure. Um, and so we have a uh, administration kit that is uh, shippable. Japan used, used our uh, an abbreviated version of our administration kit so they didn't have to do boring things like make number placards and, and uh, provide uh, registration kit uh, materials. Uh, and we have uh, shareable files in a Google Drive, which uh, allows uh, would-be organizers to really get a, a handle on uh, minimum requirements and sort of the scope of hosting an event. Um, so uh, Japan last year was our first time off continent and um, would love to um, see disaster relief trials on uh, other continents. And we have, the, we have a lot of ability to lubricate uh, uh, upstart disaster relief trials events. And merely a photo essay of, of the disaster relief trials participants in action. Um, the participants only know what kind of cargo they're going to be accumulating one hour prior to the event, but it usually includes a lot of water, a lot of food and building materials. And hope, hopefully the building materials are really awkward. <laughs> so please contact disaster relief trials at gmail.com to learn more and, uh, please visit disasterreliefTrials.com uh, to learn more. And, um, and uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions at the end of the session. So remind us, uh, what's the date coming up and where is it? June 11th uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Cully Park in Portland, Oregon is the next Portland version. Eugene is planning for uh, a Eugene version in October. Great. If, if you haven't uh, seen in action uh, the start line, it is really um, incredible. Uh, it is so much fun. So um, consider 
Um, hang on just a second here. Um, consider attending June 11th at- um, Cully Park. Cully Park. So another awkward moment. We're gonna uh, transition here um, somehow. Feel free to fill the space, uh, unmute, ask a question, type something in the chat. I will be at the disaster relief trials June 11th, super excited. Uh, the 2013 uh, Portland disaster relief trials, probably my favorite day ever. <laughs> Maddie, how are we doing for this? Uh, Looks good. Presentation, okay. This is um, something I've been thinking about the, uh, actually during the pandemic, and it, it's, it's a bit of a breezy uh, editorial. Um, so here we go. I sort of realized that a lot of people on the streets during the pandemic were people that looked like they had been on bikes at some point in their life, and they were returning. So um, I began to query just people um, who passed by uh, a, a street that I live on. And also I drove across country in 2020 and stopped in uh, eight different little towns that actually had bike facilities and um, kind of questioned people as to, uh, gosh, when was the last time you were on a bicycle? And um, sort of anecdotally got reinforced that uh, there's a big bike uh, backwards uh, return uh, to cycling um, across America. So, all right. So uh, Roger Geller and um, people at uh, PSU really described uh, the four types of cycling, which you all have been drummed into your heads. Uh, this all started about in uh, 2006. And uh, the four types obviously are the strong, fearless, the enthused, confident, the interested and concerned, which is a big block. And of course, the no way, no how. And um, this has just dominated the literature uh, since the early 2000s. Um, hello. Well, this was working. Sorry. So anyway, so I'm, I'm thinking that of this interested and concerned, the yellow group is really splintered off and is really uh, forming this new group of sort of disassociated uh, cyclists. And um, this is the beginning of my thought. And I was remembering uh, having seen so many people out on the street sharing the space with social distancing of the time that I biked across the, uh, the UK, United Kingdom and saw these play streets. And um, this is uh, from Newcastle, uh, one of my photographs and is really struck me as very similar as to what was happening in America except that there's a subtle difference or maybe a gross difference in that NACTO created streets for pandemic response and recovery, which is sort of the, the moniker for slow streets. And of course, as you all know, uh, the idea is to reduce traffic, alert uh, drivers, that there are gonna be more people in the streets. Um, and oftentimes uh, across the country, people use local traffic only barrier signs to indicate that um, this was the, the NACTO uh, labeled uh, street uh, for response and recovery. Whereas uh, in 2010, uh, England had used play streets and I find it just sort of um, um, sardonic, uh, I guess uh, that we in America could not use play streets or we couldn't use walkers and cyclists on the street, uh, that we had to have something much more officious. And also um, the fact that it was called local traffic. And um, I'm still a little sad that we don't put pedestrians at the top of that triangle or vulnerable road users. At the same time that all this was happening, as we heard very elegantly earlier this week uh, at the bike summit, uh, e-sales have uh, boom, blossomed and boomed. And, uh, and the most famous quote, of course, is from July 2020 to 21, there was a 240% increase of sales of e-bikes, whereas uh, human-powered bikes were only increased at a rate of 15%. And this brings me to, this is an image from last November uh, at the Hatfields um, trailhead, the Western trailhead in Hood River. Uh, and it's near the, the Twin Mosier Tunnels. And here is a group of 12 people who have rented e-bikes and they're going for a ride. 
when you talk to these people, you go, well, well, before you talk to them, I went, who are all these people? They don't look homogenous. Uh, they certainly aren't wearing lycra. And um, it turns out it's a wedding party. And so here's a, a group of people, not necessarily going for a bike ride, but they're going to a wedding fun event. And when you drill down to, uh, again, ask people like, well, how was your experience? And the reasons they say, oh, I love this e-bike are these reasons. I can go up hills. I can keep up with others. I don't have to work as hard. I can, I can get there without being sweaty. Uh, if I run out of energy, I always have a battery and I know I can still get back. And then the last one, uh, a little bit more subtle, is uh, with the power assist, I know I can get across the intersection before the light changes. So these are sort of, they're the non-tetosterone speed-driven three categories of e-bikes. These are the reasons why people uh, perhaps get in love with their e-bike. There's a certain irony, and I, and I think we're repeating a, a bit of a boom for cyclists. Uh, and it reminds me, <clears throat> excuse me, of actually the late 1800s. And here again, this is a time period where uh, the safety bike has just, uh, again, was uh, being sold quite a bit. People were using it. Uh, they were both racing against each other and they were also recreating. There were, uh, there's a, a person I dearly love, uh, uh, Kitty Knox, who died very young at age 26. She was a superb fast cyclist in Boston, uh, but she was also a recreational cyclist. And uh, her group of people used to go out, uh, go to pubs, um, have uh, lunches. Uh, she developed uh, a bloomer uh, outfits. Uh, and this was a time of transition for a lot of women to be seen being active and not necessarily being a porcelain doll in a carriage uh, you know, along a promenade. So a big cultural shift and we're seeing a, a sort of the same thing, not about porcelain dolls, but we're seeing much more equality happening on our streets. Susan B. Anthony, a couple of decades later, talked about the bicycle um, has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It gives women a feeling of freedom and self-reliance. That sadly did not continue in the 1900s. We saw the next hundred years really being dominated by uh, males. And um, one of the things that happened in the past uh, 50 years is we saw an incredible engineering um, development of all sorts of componentry, evolution, uh, batteries got smaller for e-bikes. Uh, we saw a variety of striders, cruisers, mountain bikes, recumbents, uh, adaptive bikes for people with disabilities. I mean, just a whole lot of changes and yet we still, in the 1900s, we still had this difficulty with, with gender being uphill to reaching some kind of equality. Um, so, so what about the 2000s? What about the past 20 years? Uh, you know, coming up to the pandemic changes that <coughs> have really occurred. And I, one of the funny things is like, who are all these masters of urban planning? Um, I think my presentation sort of has more questions than real answers. Uh, uh, more, more like the sophisticated uh, other programs that we saw this week. Uh, I'm still in the questioning stage. And uh, what was interesting, uh, the, the masses of urban, urban planning, which I find as a group of people are very attentive to active transportation issues. In 2012, there were only 21.9 degrees. I'm really sorry about that 0.9 degree that got offered. Um, but you know, 10 years later, 15, 18 years later, we have a tenfold increase of masters of urban planning degrees. Uh, in 2019, there were 228, and I'm hoping this increases because this is a source of change. Uh, this is the, a cultural shift where the education level is really beginning to develop um, some important foundations for uh, vulnerable road users. Um, you have to ask the next question, how many states in the United States have active transportation sections. You have to ask how many states have a three foot rule distance between uh, vehicles uh, and vulnerable road users. Uh, you begin to see more headlines, again, indicating this cultural shift uh, of attention being paid to uh, people. Uh, New York, etc. $1.7 billion over a decade to increase pedestrian and bus services. Uh, this is gonna increase their um, uh, 
100 and some uh, miles of protected lanes to 250 lanes. So the culture is changing on a variety of levels. One of the issues I like to look at because I've been involved with uh, policymaker rides and, and those sorts of issues is looking at how do we get more people riding? And I think this is sort of the bookends of, of culture uh, where the culture really matters. You look at the San Diego Bicycle Club, uh, California, uh, longest time bike club uh, on the West Coast. Their mission is a very simple sentence about providing community members um, with, excuse me, uh, with essentially um, seasoned cyclists uh, for racing and for coaching experience. That is their mission. When you look at Black Girls Do Bikes and the, the group I'm really talking about are the ones that are on the East Coast, um, um, Rochester, New York, Boston, uh, Washington, DC. These are incredibly healthy um, groups of people getting new people on bikes. And their mission, a little bit longer, but they say lady cyclists can support, advise, organize, uh, skill sharing, help usher new riders past barriers uh, and really rejoice in um, using cycling as a tool for function, fitness, freedom, and fun. So this is a, this is a big, big shift, uh, except my screen isn't shifting. What happened? I'm not sure. One of the things that we have in Portland is our Pedal Palooza, and that's a, a group of rides in which people suggest rides. Uh, there's a calendar. Last year, last summer, they had over 600 rides. And just to give you an idea, one of my favorite rides was the Orange Ride. Uh, here again, their mission statement was harbor a deep and maybe borderline irrational love of the color orange. Okay, and then at the end of their mission statement, they said, if orange isn't your thing, um, check out the teal ride in July. So this, this again is, is really um, sort of that binding of culture and, and people uh, being not exactly frivolous, but just for fun and just getting out and, and riding. Oops. Um, something else that's happening across America <clears throat> is again, reinforcing that use of bicycle, not for the bike itself, but for something else. Um, in the middle of Illinois, in a town of 20,000 people, not a big place, they had a public library started a bike ride of the history of their buildings that uh, were created around the late 1800s. And they had 33 people show up for their first bike ride into the land of history. Um, about a third of them were e-bikes. So here again, people are using bikes in order to bring together uh, associations and share a culture, if you will. Here in Portland, we had uh, a medical facility called Elder Place who really uh, takes care of people with uh, a variety of dementias. Uh, people tend to live a couple of years. So it's not a hospice kind of care, but it's a, a, a long, uh, sad decline associated with dementia. And um, they use pedicabs to take uh, people aged from 67 to 95 with a variety of um, cognitive uh, deficits to Peninsula Park, a park that's 100 years old. So here again, it's uh, an inclusivity that um, just hasn't existed before. So big deal. So these are all people I put into the category of back to bikes. And as an advocate, I think this is an incredible potential that we can get even more things done. We're hoping this boom of, of e-bike business is not just ending. We're hoping the boom of people getting out walking in their neighborhoods is not just ending. Uh, but we need to reach out and really welcome this group uh, into our fold. We need these people at the table. We need these people to talk about uh, what they want in their backyard, not what they don't want in their backyard. And we hope that um, the traffic triangle puts people at the very top 
and, and vehicles on that bottom uh, base of the triangle. And this takes, I think, some savvy to really look around and say, oh, we need to really acknowledge who they are. They may not be commuters. We need to figure out how to measure these people on the street in activities beyond just using the, the computer uh, barometric measure. So, um, and I think the, the uh, foundation of this is that people want to belong. People want to belong with other people. And uh, the joy of cycling brings, this, uh, brings us together. So, okay, um, chat time. Uh, I want you to um, feel free um, to uh, just simply turn off your mic and ask a question. I'm gonna stop sharing this. We can also read questions from the chat if you prefer not to unmic. I've got a question. Go Dr. ahead. Z. Uh, yep. Have you ever seen, like, I, I love the, the sort of feminist angle on the late 19th century, early 20th century biking uh, stuff. I, I often wonder about, like, the class differences involved in that, or that, like, I like guess I assume that if you were of a le lower status class, you would have been less worried about bloomers or whatever. So like, I, I really don't know the sort of different class difference in, interactions with the uh, gender and biking in those times. Have you ever heard anything about that? So there is, there is information out there. Um, if you look up Kitty Knox, um, this will take you into the world of Boston. And what was really interesting is that the community uh, she lived in, her father was actually um, a, a, a seamstress. I don't know the quite the, the right gender word for that, uh, but he made clothing and uh, she sort of inherited his skills as, as well. Um, but they lived in a very, what we would call mixed neighborhood. There were a lot of people from Europe. They were sausage makers, uh, you know, shoemakers, uh, iron workers, uh, just a whole variety of people. And sort of kind of that pre-Jane Jacobs realization that uh, tenements sometimes have a stronger uh, social network than do big, huge, anonymous blocks of apartment buildings. It, it kind of led me to think that maybe we don't know enough about um, the the our our new sort of economics of income differences and income disparities maybe there was less of that there uh it needs more investigation but there are more and more books coming out about turn of the century of the 1800s and 1900s and people how they related how they got bikes how they could afford bikes how they did that so it, it's it's coming up uh I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive answer. Maybe somebody in the audience knows. Yes, hi, um, this is Alon Rob. Thank you for your talk and um, hopeful and inspiring words. Um, yeah, as far as early uh, cyclists, especially women cyclists, obviously at the end of the um, uh, 19th century, bicycles were still expensive. So obviously it was a matter of class, uh, but then with the invention of the safety, bicycles became more available. I've done, there are wonderful books like you mentioned, uh, like um, April Streeter's book about women cyclists published by Microcosmos uh, Publishing. And I've done some research into women cyclists, early women cyclists in Portland, looking at the archives of the Oregonian and other papers and the historical society. And um, bikes were used by midwives, by some midwives. Um, who carried their equipment of their trade in a little, um, you know, a trailer. Um, and also was used by uh, people like uh, Liverpool Liz. That was the nickname of Elizabeth Smith, who was a saloon owner in Old Town um, and also um, owned the, uh, what became a racing track at Peninsula Park. Um, around 1890 um, and she, her saloon was, uh, you know, saloon slash bordello. And uh, 
according to accounts, actually, he was a cyclist and some of the sex workers, the women who worked over there with advertiser trade riding around Old Town um, on bicycles. So uh, there is, you know, but there is information about that. Um, I wanted if I um, may make a quick comment about uh, the presentation about parking. Um, you know, some cities, even in Davis, California, but cities like Vienna, uh, Paris, uh, and, and Germany have moved into um, combining parking spaces and new developments into one area at the front. I mean, obviously, I would like to see uh, no parking spaces and no cars, but as a small measure, um, you know, in the industrial area of Northwest, uh, kind of by McClay Park towards, you know, where Powell's warehouse is, there's talk about turning a lot of that area over there into apartments. And it would be great if they put all the parking for cars in one area at the front of the development and then provide free bikes or for elderly people who maybe can't ride or sick um, golf carts. And I figured by calculating that if there are a thousand people who won't be driving the quarter mile to their um, homes every day, I mean, that's saving hundreds of thousands of uh, gallons, you know, yearly. So there are things to do, but uh, I just wanted to say, I, I really enjoyed this conference and uh, the great work that everybody has been putting into it. Um, I'm a, a lifelong cyclist. I don't never drove a car. I'm also just joined the city of Portland's bicycle advisory committee. And I also co-host the bike show on Kebu, which is the first Wednesday of the month. So thank you very much. And let's sail on on our bikes. Amen. The, I just want to say one of the many problems with a site-specific parking mandate is it actually makes it like economically stupid to do a shared parking like you're describing in a lot of cases like it would make a lot of sense if we could combine all the parking uses in a neighborhood into one lot share it there even maybe a couple stories and maybe if they can charge for it uh, but the saying that you need to have it on the location makes that infeasible so it takes that option off the table basically uh yeah i know there there are a lot of complications and obviously a lot of people feel like, hey, you're going to tell me where to park my car. I mean, this is America. We do whatever we want. But uh, as the waters rise and, uh, you know, the the crazy, the interesting, challenging weather we had the last two weeks increases, uh, maybe more people will change their views. So. Whatever we want, as long as we can afford a car. Yeah. But then it, it really begs an interesting question, Michael and Alan, in terms of how do we get these policies really in, in the talking space, uh, which is the prelude for the actions, you know, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the binding of, of how we make neighborhoods and how we remake neighborhoods into more efficient places to live and more equitable places to live. and and less redlined in a in a hazy way um that that happens uh so you know how do how do we elevate that so that programmers uh who are running programs at at pbot uh in metro you know begin to facilitate these broader concepts that will be much more efficient for the whole society um you know that's the that's the the nut isn't it what do you think Michael or, or anybody else? Well, I guess, I mean, I can speak for a minute. Um, you know, something that comes up in a lot of my conversations is like, well, anything, if we're taking away parking or we're saying you shouldn't be required to build parking, it means like we want you to be car free. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, I live in an old building, it has no parking, there's 16 apartments, and uh, it just means I park my car on the street, you know, a few blocks away. Um, it makes it a little bit more of a hassle right, to go get my car where my bike is just right downstairs in the bike room. Um, but, you know, some of these, you know, changes that we're talking about, people think like it's a, you drive everywhere or you don't own a car at all. And there's a lot of gray space in the middle to make a lot of different changes. Um, I think everyone can drive a little bit less, right? We can put more active transportation into our lives and it's not like an all or nothing um, conversation. 
And that's a self-organizing thing. Like what Katie just described is like, you don't need a planner to be like, well, 25% of people will be in this category and 20% of this, you can just be like, oh no, I'm making a decision for myself about how convenient I want my car to be. And somebody else is making a decision about their much more important car to them, right? Yeah, so it's more about um, more options for people, right? I don't drive a lot. It is more important for me to be in a walkable neighborhood. That's where I choose to live. Um, if you own four cars, you probably wouldn't live where I live. Um, if you need a big closet, you wouldn't live in my apartment. Um, so it's just about more options um, for people to, to find something that works for them. And a lot of people, what they need is a, you know, a walkable community, destination close by, not a long commute, cheaper housing costs. Um, so trying to get that end of the spectrum as well. By the way, that was not at all a crack on the four types or five types of cyclists. That was different, unrelated. That's a very valuable typology. And uh, this is alone again, and I hope I didn't give the impression that I think it's all or nothing, or um, I do realize that a lot of people, you know, can't cycle for various health reasons, uh, and also distances, you know, are great to get to work, there isn't always good public transportation, um, and I've been fortunate that I've always lived really close to work, so that, and then towns that were mostly university towns and flat. So that, that was good. Um, I think political leadership obviously is really important when I think of cities that have made tremendous change in the last 10 years as far as cycling, like Vienna and Paris, a lot had to do with the fact that Vienna has had a social democratic government since World War II mostly, and the Green Zone city government. Um, Paris has had a very dynamic uh, mayor Hidalgo, who's a you know socialist. So uh, uh, to answer the big question, how do we get there? Obviously, it it, it involves so many aspects of changing society um, and uh, um, economics and equality and our own consciousness. So it's uh, so many so many layers, but. So thank you. I, I think part of it is also the, the long haul, really having the long arc view. Um, I, I and Maddie were on a ride last night and uh, with uh, Roger Geller, who's the uh, head of the PBOT program. And um, he was telling about a couple of death threats to uh, city people who wanted to put in a roundabout in the 1990s that people were so angered that uh, they were going to slow down traffic at an intersection that two individuals actually received death threats. And to think that, oh my goodness, uh, that kind of response, uh, and, and now it's a much milder response, thankfully. Um, and there have not- worked. Uh, yes. <laughs> we don't have any roundabouts. <laughs> And we see roundabouts, you know, populating our city streets, you know, quite a bit. But oh, okay, that kind of roundabout. Right. And 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 also, you have to understand, uh, Vera Katz and also uh, Blumenauer actually tried to talk the BTA into not suing the city of Portland in order to get a bike lane alongside the Coliseum. So, um, you know, we all have changed and grown and evolved and. Um, I, I think that's the, the testimony that we have to keep in our head that um, we have to think about the long arc and we have to think about the repetitive message and the sincere message that we want to get out to the world. Um, it, I want to do a quick chime check. It is one. It's actually 101. Um, I want to, uh, if people can stay, you can continue to ask questions, but I want to quickly thank our presenters uh, for those who have to go. Uh, thank you, Katie, Michael, Mike, and Dr. Z. Thank you to our